So thanks for the to the whole team, actually. And Steve, it was good to have you up here, brother. I'll just go collect my stuff down there. Okay. All right. Am I on? I'm not on. I sounded to myself like I'm on. Yeah. Oh, you heard that? Oh, uh, since, like, we actually don't, the way actually isn't in it, one of its own services on Sunday, uh, I just want to say to all of your, you mothers, uh, happy Mother's Day. I mean, thank goodness for mamas. Thank, thank goodness for mamas who love their children even when they're unlovable. See, I, I, I reposted a thing I posted like back in 2015 to my mom, you know, and, and just an honor to her because, you know, I never did put like mom on, as a tattoo on me, but I always took her everywhere in my heart. But as a young man, and I would like bring all my friends over, and sometimes it was like the middle of the night, you know, we'd come in all frying potatoes and kind of inebriated, and you know how it goes. And my mom was just so sweet and so gracious, but she would embarrass me so much. And my my friends are like, what's wrong with you? you got the best mom ever. I wish we had, we wish we had a mom like your mom. And so, like, you know, as I grew up and then I don't have my mom here on the planet with me now, I realize how right they were. She was, like, very special and so... If uh, you if you have the honor of still having your mom here with you, just love on her this weekend and just go overboard and do special things and like you guys can even like either take her out to eat or cook dinner for her or, and and don't make what you like make what she likes. <laughs> Sometimes guys are terrible at that. <laughs> but anyway, uh, so happy Mama's Day uh, because Mama's. That's another thing I was going to share because, you know, I would tell my mom, yeah, I, I, man, I did wrong, I did bad. And she goes, oh, no, you did it. She wouldn't believe that I could do wrong, you know. And that's a mom believing in their kids, you know. And uh, I'm pretty sure that Mary thought Jesus was special, too. <laughs> oh, you guys are a hard group tonight. Jeez. So I'm going to do something that, uh, I don't know, I, yeah, well, I, I want to start by saying the, the, whole, the whole thing of, about the kingdom is about giving. And, and God, you know, teaches us through his word that it's about giving. And, and God so loved the world that he gave. I mean, that's how we got rescued from the curse that we was in. But I just want to, like, focus in on you know, sowing and reaping. I mean, Patrick just took us through a thing that was that was really good, Patrick. I mean, you did half my stuff right there, so that's okay. Or I say my stuff, I, you know, half the half the scripture that I kind of had in sight. But I kind of want to take a, a you know a different kind of run at it than normal, um, because it giving goes all the way back to the beginning. And this whole sowing and reaping principle is laid out for us. And, and, and a farmer, if you used to talk to a farmer, they understand that you don't grow what you don't plant. So if you want to reap a harvest, you got to sow. And we're just not talking one singular thing. We're talking in everything. And so I've got scripture that I want to share with you tonight to kind of show where I'm where I but show you what the Bible says about sowing and reaping. And if you really want to revolutionize your life and come to that place where you're just not surviving, okay, but that you're thriving spiritually in kingdom principles, the divine order that God has put forth for us. And I want to say this right now, too. When a lot of preachers get up and they start speaking, and this is why... Some preachers kind of avoid it. I don't do it a lot. But some people start cringing because if the preacher starts talking about money and offering and tithing and everything, 
people start going, oh, because they start feeling like, well, maybe I haven't been doing what I should do. Listen, this is not about bringing conviction on anybody or condemnation. Now listen to the Holy Spirit. Talks to you about it. Listen to Him. I'm simply wanting to educate you, okay? And, and so I'm going to try to do it because I'm a preacher and it's hard to kind of do a little teaching thing when I want to preach. But we'll see how that goes, okay? You guys can let me know after. You can critique me afterwards. I usually don't open myself up to that. <laughs> we'll see. We'll see how it goes. But anyway, uh, so this whole sowing and reaping principle goes all the way back to the beginning. Let's see, what do you got there? You got Genesis 8, 20, uh, 21. Now, this is, Genesis 8 is a brand new world. The flood has come. Everything was basically like wiped out. and Noah and his family and all those animals were on that ark for a long time. And so finally the time comes where he can come out. And it, does anybody know where that, that ark was lodged? What mountain? Erat. Does anybody know what that means in Hebrew? I get to tell you something. Do you know? You know you're right at it. You want me to say it? The curse is reversed. That's what Ararat means. And when he came off, the first thing that he did, when he got out on dry land, he built an altar and he did a burnt offering to the Lord. And listen, the Lord smelt a soothing aroma. And the Lord said in his heart, listen to this, the Lord speaking to himself says in his heart, I will never ever again curse the ground for man's sake. Although the imagination of man's heart is evil from his youth, nor will I ever again destroy every living thing as I have done. So all those people who want to like say apocalypse means damnation don't have a clue what they're talking about. Because all of God's creation, he created it, he looked at it, and he saw it, and he saw it was good. And he loves his creation. That's why he was willing to do everything he could to dispel the evil in what was going on in the earth and to bring back right order and so when this man Noah comes off and he offers an offering and a sacrifice to God, God loved it and it touched God's heart. Don't you just want to touch God's heart? Man can do that in his obedience and in his love toward God. You see, God gives his love toward us all the time, but when we reciprocate with that and we show how much we love him and we talk to him about our love and then we begin to bring things to him to show him that we love him that's incredible that's one way that you can show God that you're loving him back and listen to this and so he says you ready Genesis 8 22 some of you Bible uh, scholars need to write this one down I, I only got one extra set of notes tonight so they're not notes, they're just scriptures. But anyway, uh, while the earth remains, seed time and harvest, cold and heat, winter and summer, and day and night shall not cease. So let's just go back. Look around. The earth is still here. Seed time and harvest is still going on. And in it shall as long as the earth remains. So... This whole sowing and reaping. So what is that? Because I know you're thinking in your mind, well, that, that's talking about just, you know, the seeds, that the things that have seed. But I want you to know that everything that God created, he put seed within it. I'm going to get to that in a second. But everything has a seed. And so Isaiah 55.10, let's, let's look at that for a second. For as the rain comes down and the snow from heaven and does not return there, but water the earth and make it bring forth and bud that it may give seed to the sower and bread to the eater. Okay, before we go on, uh, everybody's an eater. Just absolutely, everybody's an eater. You got to be an eater to survive, or you can't. But this is where I want to talk to you about being. Uh, 
see a cedar, a sower of the seed, because if you learn to sow the seed, then there will always be harvest to plenty. And instead of just eating everything, what's that other pillar, pillar that you talk about, Miller time, time? The pillar of learning to be a not just a taker, but a giver. See, God wants to bring us into a, 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 the, the, the dynamics of the kingdom where you're just not taking in, but you're giving out. You see, many times when we come to God, we're a tore up mess. And we need God desperately. And we need God selfishly, just for me. And that's why the, 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 the temple in the Old Covenant was set up, you know, kind of a little different because you just couldn't come into the inner sanctuary, what they called the most holy place. Then there was another place that surrounded the most holy place that was called the holy place. And then outside the holy place were the outer courts. And then that which surrounded the outer courts was the walls. And there was a gate, a front entrance that brought you in. Okay, And so the walls were called salvation, the gates were called thanksgiving, and the courts that you walked upon was called praise. So as you approached God and you came into the sanctuary, you had to come in through praise and thanksgiving. But the outer court was for just the typical people. And out there it was all about them, you see. Because only the priests could go into the inner court. And that was where the, the, the showbread and the, the laver, you know, with the water in it, that was actually lined with re reflective mirror, too. And the reason that was there is because when the priests would come in and prepare the sacrifice, it was bloody. And so they would wash their self in that laver. Now, here's the thing. That everything in that inner place represented Jesus because he's the showbread. He's, he is the laver. He is the manna. He is the living bread. He is the God of the candles, the, 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 the seven churches. All of the things that are in there is about him. Okay, And so the priests attend to that. Now there was only one priest, the high priest, that could go beyond that into the very presence of Almighty God where the Ark of the Covenant set, where the, angel, the cherubs faced one another and his presence was right at the center of that which is called the mercy seat. And, and the high priest had to be very careful because when he entered in, he had to enter in with the blood sacrifice already prepared and he had to go in and anoint the horns of the altar and do all of this stuff and he couldn't make any mistakes because there was no grace at that time. There was nothing standing between the mistakes of God and, I mean, the mistakes of man and the very presence of God. So everything had to be perfect. I didn't realize I was going to do this. But anyway, let's back back up, back out to the outer court, you see. And I want to get back to the left, uh, just since we got there, I got I to gotta say that. But I want to use a cartoon to do it, you know, being me. But, so you come in and it's all about you. You come into that and you're, and you're a hot mess and you just need Jesus. And so you're very selfish with it and some of you are very secretive with it. Because you don't want to admit all your shortcomings and your mistakes and your failures. But you know that you need help. That you know that, uh, that you need help from something greater than yourself. And so as you begin to reach out and you come in through praise and thanksgiving, and you might have a big long p petition too, that will begin to change as you, you begin to know who you are. And you're just going to begin to give thanks to God for what he's already done in your behalf. And then you'll see it. Then it'll happen. That's called moving into the faith realm. But you're not there yet because you're out in the outer court and you're going through healing and it's like surgical and everything else. And so the priests are out in the inner place. But we live in a time today that we're all supposed to be moving into the inner place. Because what the priests did was for the people. They were doing the things that pertain to the people. Because you see, what they did was all about, not them, but about you. About those in the outer court. 
So all the stuff that they were doing there was pertaining to the others. So you come in for yourself, but then pretty soon, what you're doing in the kingdom, you're doing it for others. And it's not about me no more. It's about you. It's about them. That's the work of a priest. And by the way, the church, every one of you is called to this order of priesthood. Because we are a kingdom of kings. We have a king here. Hi, king. How you doing, buddy? Good to have you here. We are an order of kings and priests. And, and, and understanding the difference between a king and a priest, it, this goes with, I mean, I'm not off track because we're talking about sowing and reaping. What a king does, he enlarges the borders, the boundaries. He brings in bounty. He's a warrior or she's a warrior. They go in and defeat the enemy and they drive back the darkness and they enlarge the boundaries of the kingdom. That's what King David did. A priest takes care of all the orderly stuff in the house. Remember that David wanted to build the house for God, the actual temple, and God said, you can't. You know, he loved David, but David was covered with blood. And he said, you can't do it. I've chosen your son. I'm going to raise him up. And he's going to simplify or show what it would be like uh, for what I have prepared for the human race because we're going to bring up a king that will sit on the throne of an eternal kingdom. And so he was doing all this through David and using Solomon, his son, to bring this order to show what God was going to do through his son, Jesus Christ. An eternal king of a kingdom that has no end. The thing is, we come to him now. We don't have to go through all that bloody sacrifice. All them animals, which didn't take away sins anyway, they just covered until Jesus would come. Uh got taken all out of the way. The animals was pretty happy about Jesus coming too. <laughs> Creation is pretty excited about you men and women realizing who you are and come to your full potential and rise up. Do you know that it says that Creation travails and it cries out for the manifestation of the sons of God. Do you know what that means? That we would come to our full potential. That the glory would come upon us, which would bring us into our full calling, our full purpose, and our true identity, knowing who we are. Okay, talking about identity, let's go back to the laver inside. The, I'm going to be on this for a month, okay? I just can tell already. How many verses have I gotten through? Anyway, there's too many places to go, but this is a rabbit trail i got to keep following. So we go back into the holy place, which is not the most holy, but it's the holy place. And remember that laver I told you about where they walked? No, there was a reason why they lined it with mirror. Because if you looked into it, you could see your reflection. Did I promise I would antagonize you with a, a Disney cartoon? You know, what makes cartoons these Disney cartoons, some of them so powerful, these, these movies that they make, and you're like, and they're like, and it hits you, and it's like, well, this is better than some, you know, where they have real actors, these cartoon, little cartoon characters really get you, and the Lion King was like that, because there was, I'll tell you what, they put a, a, a spark of the divine in many of these movies, and they did that with the Lion King, and remember when the, the, the young cub loses his father, and he and it's it's left to him to step into the plate. Now he's got to f lead the pride, and he's scared and he's like running and he don't know what to do and he's confused and he's lost and he don't know who he is. He his identity is lost and he comes to this pool and he's looking in this pool of water. Anybody remember that? You see that? And the water shimmering and he sees himself and he's timid and he's scared, and all of a sudden as he's staring at the image in the water, he begins to see his father in him. And he realizes, I am my father's son. He's in me. Everything changed at that moment because he realized his true identity. What did they do? They stole that all from the word. That's what they did. I got a bunch of other ones too that if I talk, you know, you'd see, but we're not going to go into that right now. 
But that laver, when you look and you'd see the reflection, but here, the blood was the shadow of the Son of God. And so you're looking through the blood, which is the atonement, and you're seeing the reflection through the blood of the sacrifice. So who is in the reflection is who you're supposed to be because it's the identity of the Son of God manifested in you. Now that's just one little part of the holy place. But bringing you to the place that where, where you need to be. And this all comes because you dared to come into that place. And you had to pass beyond the outer court. Move beyond yourself. And to get to that place, you can't be a taker and get into there. You can't do the work of a priest until you decide it's just not about me anymore. It's about all of them out there. It's about the ones hurting. It's about the ones that need truth. It's the ones that we've got to go to and compel to come into this place. Then you start doing the work of the priest. Does that make sense? Some of you will do the work of a king. You'll go out and bring spoil in. But even the priests do that. Because that's what they all about. They know it's about bringing stuff into the house of God. But the king goes out and just, you know, everything, he, he pulls things into his bubble and enlarges his territory and then he brings it into God's house. And, and I, I, I need you to understand too, in this life, it's just not about seeding a little bit of what you have. It's about you bringing what you have to God and then He will do what He desires and you're going to be blessed. I mean, your, your riches will increase beyond uh, your comprehension because now you're living in the world of the kingdom of heaven which is an eternal kingdom. We're talking about a kingdom which the Bible describes that has a pavement up there that's pure gold. And it's so pure that it's transparent. In other words... You can see through it. That's, that's pretty pure. Did you know that transparent gold is amazing? Did you know that transparent gold blocks radiation? That very, very thin shield. By the way, it's what they put in an astronaut's helmet, the, the face, because they can't put lead in there to block the radiation. The suit blocks radiation, but they need a, a something they can see through. And the only thing that they could do that blocks the radiation from penetrating the glass was a shield of gold that's trans, shield of gold that's transparent and it stops the radiation from going through the glass. Y'all know that? Transparent gold, baby. Who would have known? He wants to do that to you. And he wants to purify you that pure so that you're transparent. That you have no darkness. There's no shadow in you just like there's no shadow in Him. Hmm. I, just, I think I just shared that a week or two ago. Because you see, in Him there is no darkness. You know, I'm not going to keep you long tonight, so we'll cut this one short. Because we're going to keep going with this if that's all right. Okay? But So you've heard me say that there was a reason why... God sent Jesus because you know that in the scripture he's called the seed. And once you grasp that, he's the greatest seed we can sow. But you don't hold back anything from God. Because are you talking about money? Yes. Are you talking about time? Yes. Are you talking about other sacrifices? That is the greatest one. That's part of my I don't I'm not going to get there yet. Thank you. Of course it's love. But Actually, I give you a preview of that right now because people who are consumed with law versus grace and don't really get it say that tithing is not, it's not a part of the new covenant because it was under the law. Well, the, the Levitical tithing, you know what Levitical means? The law. Because it was from Levi and all of his sons and his offspring that become the priesthood, which administered the law but there is tithe outside of that too okay because tithe was given before the law ever existed and Levi while in the loin of Abraham tithed to Melchizedek which was the type of Christ showing that 
the tithe to Christ is the greater tithe, and nothing nullifies that. I said, nothing nullifies that. Let me say it again. Nothing nullifies that. That's why he said, I am the Lord God. And I change not. And it says Jesus Christ the same yesterday, today, and forever. And then Jesus in the scripture telling the religious people, he said, do you know, you, you, he said that there's one standing here that's greater than the temple. And he said, and you want to, you want to get on me about doing something on the Sabbath. He goes, don't you, and this all started because he was walking through the fields on the Sabbath day, and he began to pluck the heads of grain and give them to his disciples. And the religious people got indignant. Maybe we should just jump down and post that. No, we don't have it. We don't have it. Oh, but I'll, oh, I got it over here. <clears throat> so just hang with me. <clears throat> he said to them in Matthew 23, can you guys remember this? Uh, 23, 23. He says, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, you hypocrites, for you pay tithe of mint and anise and cumin and have neglected... So I'm, I'm getting there. I'm getting to it. You have neglected the weightier matters of the law, which is justice and mercy and faith. And these things, and that mercy is love. Okay, that's the love of God. Okay, These things you have ought to have done without leaving the other things undone. In other words, you're supposed to do all that, but you have taken and neglected the things that are even more important, like justice and mercy. You put your law before you put people. And so he says to them, in, in, in Matthew 9, 11, he says, you go and learn what this means. I desire mercy and not sacrifice. In other words, love comes way before all your bloody sacrifices. And he said, for I will, I did not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. So the only hope he gave those religious people was to go learn this. Go find out what it means that I desire mercy and not sacrifice. You guys need to understand why love is more important than all your religious rigmarole. All your religious calisthenics isn't going to get you nowhere without the mercy of God. You guys get that? And so he goes on to say, Have you not read in the law that on the Sabbath the priests in the temple profane the Sabbath and are blameless? Because they work on the Sabbath. And right before that he said, Didn't you hear about when David went in and he took the food? And they were guiltless. They were blameless. He said, You're putting your law before people. Don't you guys love this? He said, this is why I had to go read this. In Matthew 12, 6, it says, Yet I say to you that in this place there is one greater than the temple. He, you know who he was talking about? He was talking about himself. And, he, and the reason he had forewarned them earlier about the, 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 you know, finding out what mercy before sacrifice meant, listen to what he gets him on this. And this is like two chapters later. He said, but if you had known what this means, I desire mercy and not sacrifice, you would not have condemned the guiltless. Who was the guiltless? It was the seed. He was the one who had no guilt. But yet they condemned him. And you see, they missed all that because of their religious law. And he says, for the Son of Man is Lord even of the Sabbath. Aren't you glad that you know? Aren't you glad that we have Holy Spirit now that can reveal these things to us? You know, I've said before, I'm glad I didn't live in hit that day because I would have probably been there condemning him, you know, too. You know, being all religious and everything. And thank God for Jesus. Thank God that he's a family man, that he's, his love and his mercy is more important to him than uh, everything else. But when we begin to you know, take part of this love and we begin to understand that it's the love that's more important, that's what frees us up to actually come into that place we're willing to do whatever it takes to support what God wants. See, we got to get to a place 
where we want what God wants. And like I said last week, you know, God's plan for your life outdates yours. It goes way back to the foundation of the earth. And His plan for you is better than anything you could come up with. And so if you can surrender to Him and come into that love relationship, He can begin to activate you into a, a, a place of living and giving and loving and receiving that is of no end. And it's just not going out and trying to earn a buck. It's because you're becoming part of that kingdom that is based upon living and giving, sowing and reaping. Listen, if you plant to, I don't know why, but my parents, they taught me how to, you know, plant gardens and stuff and for some reason they would always put like two to three seeds kernels into a, a little you know pocket as we would have the rows all set up it, you know and because one stock was going to grow there but we would always drop two or three in there for some reason that's what my dad told me to do and sure enough there would be a stock and then on that stock there would be like ears are you guys listening this is eerie but hang with me <laughs> two Sometimes three ears on a stalk. Once in a while, it'd be weird, no before, you know. And I, there m- might have been some more than that even, you know. But here, so here we got all this, this corn. Now think about this. And I know that most of you probably never took the time to count how many kernels are on a, an ear of corn. I have. Anywhere from 750 to 1,100. That's one ear. Duplicate that by three. So we're talking, uh, let's just round it off. 3,000 kernels per kernel because you dared to sow it and water it because you let it die and you put it back in the ground. See, that's why he's the seed. That's why Jesus said, unless a seed falls to the ground and dies and abides alone, it will not bring forth fruit. So you want to produce, you've got to let yourself die to self and get joined to Him in the resurrected life that raised Jesus from the dead, that same life will quicken your mortal body, and then He will begin to produce fruit of righteousness in you by the Holy Spirit. Things that are like so amazing and incredible because you will begin to care. You will begin to love. You will begin to be gentle and compassionate toward one another and long-suffering. And you'll let love rule your life instead of law. I would rather be love-driven than law-driven any day. Law-driven any day. Some of you lawbreakers know what I'm talking about. And you came to your senses after you was incarcerated because breaking the law put you there. And then you wanted nothing but love from everybody, including the judge. I mean, you know. <laughs> Listen, Jesus loved you from the start, even when you were a rascal. He cared about you. And, and He wants you to get, understand these principles so that you can release them into your life. But you've got to be willing. Patrick... You gotta agree with me with this because, you know, successful people take risks. They do things that nobody else, that's why everybody's not rich because people aren't willing to take the risk or the gamble. But let me tell you this, when you're dealing with the kingdom of God, it's not a gamble. It's His Word and it's impossible for God to lie. That's why He says in Malachi, try me at this. Give and see if I won't bring it back to you. Hand over fist. Do you know that the Scripture, if I was to begin to just quote Scripture, you know I would be up here for days reading out of the Bible everything pertaining to living and giving, to sowing and reaping, to bringing an offering to God, to coming into that place where God wants to bless you. And it's not about, it's like what Paul said to those Corinthians. He said it's not about the gift from you on your behalf, it's because of what's going to happen when you do it. You see, because he's trying to get to them a blessing, and, and he's not doing it to pull a blessing out of their pocket for himself, but for them to understand the principle that when they move into this, that it's going to open the floodgates of heaven, and something's going to happen. Let me tell you, God can bless you better than you could ever bless yourself. Because You know why? Because he's the blesser. And He knows how to do it. And He wants to bring you into that place of, dare I say the word, obedience. Because if you can dare 
to go and move with him as he leads you. Patrick, it's pretty hard to get people to take risks with their money, huh? It is. I mean, in business. It, it, but, it, but as they do, you have a business that, that provides a security for them. And some of them get it. I mean, that's why big corporations use a company like yours. But let me tell you something. There is such a security in doing it God's way and, and, and moving in the Word with Him and releasing what you have so that He can bring it back in abundance to you. That's why the Scripture in Luke, what is it, Luke 6, 38 says, Give, and it shall be given unto you good measure, shaken together, pressed down, and running over shall it come back to you. Amen. It works. I'm not up here trying to sell God. Listen, and this is not the case either. Don't you dare put ten bucks in the, in the bucket and say, okay, now God, you owe me a hundred. Because it's a tenfold. Listen, it's a lifestyle. And you've got to sow in faith. And you've got to do it in love. Let's go back to the love and not the sacrifice. Because What does it say? God loves a cheerful giver. So when you come understanding the principle and you're giving, do it in love. i got so much more I want to tell you, but I'm going to quit right now because we got communion tape set at the table. But remember, as the day, and i got more scripture that I want to share with you in the coming days too, but give it forethought. Think about it. Don't do it haphazardly. Prepare. The Apostle Paul spends a whole chapter about preparing your gift ahead of time. And you, if you really want to be blessed of God, do something dangerous. Are you listening? I mean reckless. With reckless abandon. Say, God, what do you want me to do? <laughs> See, trust him and surrender to what he tells you to do. I, I know it's wild because he's had me do it and I, and I was scared. And I don't get scared too much. But it scared me. But he keeps his word. He blesses us. And I want you to all to be blessed. Think about it, this whole house moved into the principle of living and giving, what would happen not to just this house, what would happen in each and every one of your individual lives as you begin to move with God in obedience, you would open up in your homes the floodgates of heaven. And I'm just not talking about finances. I'm talking about emotionally. I'm talking about joy and peace. I'm talking about healed relationships. I'm talking about forgiveness in those relationships that begins to flow where the impossible things begin to happen. And you, you get, and it's just not happiness. It's joy down on the inside because that's one of the gifts that begins to, that's one of the fruits that is produced by the Holy Spirit as you surrender to Him and that joy begins to rise up on the inside. Here's the nice thing about joy. There's a, there's a thousand reasons every day why you can lose your happiness because it's, it's based upon your circumstance and your outer environment. But joy is a spiritual thing that comes from the inside and the world didn't give it to you and the world can't take it away from you and it's based upon a relationship with Him and that is a, per, a thing that is produced in fruit through the Spirit of God working on the inside of you. Be blessed. We'll see you next time. Communion table is set. Receive the body and the blood and be joined together with Him.